So when I was a chaplain in a school in a certain town in County Cork, uh, I remember on one occasion, one of the, the girls, uh, she said to me, Father, is it true, is it true that you know, we have to like, suffer before we get into heaven? Is it true that, no, actually, she phrased it a little more provocatively. Is it true that God wants us to suffer before we get into heaven? And to be honest, my heart just sank at the question that somebody would consider that this is how it works, that, that God, our loving Father, uh, would want us to suffer before we get into heaven. Because we, 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 we shouldn't misunderstand how, how, the whole, how the whole thing works. Uh, God wants us to learn to love before we get into heaven. That's, that should be, that's, that's how it works. God wants us to learn to love before we get into heaven. Why? Well, that's fairly obvious, because heaven must be a kingdom of love. So if I get into heaven and I don't love or I don't want to love or life is all about me and everybody serving me and my needs, well, then I'm not ready for heaven. Right? If I get into heaven and I'm just entirely self-centered and everything is about me and my career and losing the extra pounds and HD brows, if you're not familiar with them, it's where your eyebrows are absolutely perfect. I, I, Connor, do you want to show them? <laughs> uh, so... so um, that's, it, it, it's a big thing, apparently. I wouldn't know, because apparently I don't have eyebrows. Anyway, uh, so it's like, it, when, when, like when everything, 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 your whole life is revolved around these things, and nothing else is really important. You know, other people aren't important. My, actually, even my children aren't that important. Uh, and my family isn't important. Nothing is really important. I'm just me achieving these things. And, and my, all of my time goes, all of my money, all of my effort, all of my free time, all of my thoughts go into it, okay? So if that's what I'm piling everything into, then you see, I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually ready for heaven. I'm not ready for heaven at all. But we can be saying to ourselves, yeah, but I haven't killed anyone. <laughs> the, the bar isn't, don't kill anyone. The bar is, do you love? Are, are, you, are you loving? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I saved a puppy once from a, one of those shelter things. I got a puppy and yeah, yeah, but that's nice. But, <laughs> We're called to so much more than saving puppies. Do you love? And, and how, how, do we, how do we know? How do we know if we love? Because the danger today is, see, love is thrown, the word love is thrown around so easily that love is, is very much reduced to a feeling, a sentiment. So, you know, I love um, my friends. You know, I message them every day and I show them exactly what I've eaten. I take a picture of my breakfast and my lunch and my dinner, and I post it up, and then they, then they send a thumbs up back. So yeah, we're, we're pretty close. We're pretty close. And um, do you know, so we keep in touch about all the important things. Do you know when I'm, when I'm on holidays, me on the beach? <laughs> so you have, to, you have to keep adjusting your chin, because when your chin is up, it makes your neck look thinner. So it takes away all the, so you have to kind of keep, keep an eye on the chin, head up, head up, makes your neck look thinner. So we're, like, we're close friends, you know what I mean? They're, they're, in, they're informed of all of the important stages of my life. <sighs> Such is friendship today. Uh, so so uh, if, this, if, like, if this is everything, I mean, have I really learned to love? Have I learned to love? So what's the heart of love? What's at the very, very heart of love? It's not just a feeling. It's not just a feeling, because feelings come and go, okay? The alarm goes off in the morning, what's your feeling? Some people here, there's one person in this chapel, right? Maybe more, but there's at least one who's a morning person, right? <laughs> My goodness, <laughs> what even is that, okay? <laughs> the alarm goes off and their first thought is, yippee! <laughs> Uh, I had a, se a seminary in, in I, I shared a room when I was in seminary, and uh, my, my confrere in the room, he was from Colombia, he was a very, very funny guy, uh, but on one occasion, the alarm went off, beep, beep, beep. we used to get up at half five in the morning to be in the chapel for quarter to six, anyway, long story, so the, the alarm would go off, beep, 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 and he just went, <laughs> 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 mommy, <laughs> that's kind of me, just I don't say mommy. But um, yeah, I just I don't get hold. morning people, my goodness. But it's like, what, what, like, so that's a feeling. Or then you come down and, you know, it's uh, waffles and maple syrup for breakfast. Feelings increase, or it's just porridge, or it's a Friday, so we're just, just toast. Or, uh, you know, would you mind putting out the rubbish? I'm hungry. 
I have my lunch. I want to get my. I want to eat first. Well, the, the rubbish is overflowing. You know what I mean? We've got a group in here. We just need to need to get them bins emptied. Fine, feelings go down. You know what I mean? And someone says, "Hello, Father." Hi, morning. Feelings back up. Yeah. <laughs> so feelings come and go. You cannot, you cannot base love on feelings. Otherwise, love lasts five minutes here, two minutes there, and three minutes there. And like, that's not love. That, that's just emotion, right? Love is far more than mere emotion. So what is love? What is love? Like, this is really essential for us as, as Christians and as Catholics to understand what love is. Otherwise, again, we won't, if we don't know what it is, we don't know what we're aiming for. And if you don't know what you're aiming for, how are we going to get there? If you could, let's go for a drive. Where are we going? I don't know. Well, when did we get there? So what route are we taking? I mean, you ha we have to have a, the goal has to be clear. So if we're aiming to, to live lives of love in order to be transformed into love, in order to get into heaven, well, then what is love? Well, in, in our Christian understanding, love sacrifices itself for the other. Love sacrifices itself. For, so love gives of itself for the other. So then love serves and love forgives and, and love lifts up the needy and love takes care of the other. And love actually considers the other's needs more important than one's own. Remember, love, love goes out of oneself for the other. That's what love is. So love is getting up at four o'clock in the morning for the sixth time to change a nappy. Or as I've heard a friend of mine call it recently, a poonami, <laughs> right? A poonami, when the nappy hasn't succeeded in containing all of the deposit and the deposit ends up the whole way up the baby grows to the neck, right? A poonami. Uh, so like that, that's love, right? Love is like for those three or four years of a child's uh, early youth, uh, not sleeping very much. And then, then along comes child number two. That's great. We're never going to sleep again. <laughs> and then child number three. That's uh, what a gift. Thank you. <laughs> I really need to sleep. And, and you know, that, that, but that's love because you're coming out of yourself for someone else. You're giving of yourself for someone else. This is love. This is love. So this is what we're learning then. Uh, this, that's what this life is for to learn to love, not to go through a certain amount of suffering. Suffering on its own is absolutely useless. But suffering, or the cross, maybe better said, the cross can teach us to love in a way that, that it, kind of other experiences can't. Because it's easy to love those who love you. You know what I mean? If everyone every day did exactly what you want, when you want, how you want, told you you're amazing, you're wonderful, and you, everything was perfect about you, and you had everything you needed, well, then love isn't hard. And then I have to actually, have you even really loved? Have you even learned to love if, if that's your experience of life? Whereas someone offends you and says, ah, typical Connor. <laughs> right? And you're like, ouch. Okay. You now have an opportunity an opportunity to forgive and to love and to pray for that person and maybe to try and reconcile, to find out, sorry, did, did I do something? Did I offend you in some way? Is, is everything okay? Uh, you have an opportunity to, to grow in virtue, to grow in love, and that, that can be hard because you'd rather maybe see, you'd rather, you'd rather just fight fire with fire. Or in a relationship where, where someone is maybe even unfaithful to you, or a relationship where someone has hurt you, and, and it's, it's hard, it hurts, it hurts. But then, through the grace of God, you can, you can learn to forgive. When, when things go wrong and we've got a lot of pressure, financial pressure and relationship pressure, and, and today now, like the fear of COVID and death, which was the fear of death, should have always been there, but anyway. Um, uh, all that kind of fear out there. We have now an opportunity to, to love, to choose love, to choose love to choose to love. So we, we don't get swallowed by the fear out there. We don't get followed by the anger out there. We don't get, followed, get swallowed by all of the, you know, it's the government, it's the Freemasons, it's Bill Gates, it's, you know, we don't get swallowed by that because we can't change that. We must be transformed into love. So we love and bring light and bring hope and bring consolation everywhere we go.
These other things, they may be happening, they may be true, it's not really important, as in I can't fix it. My job is to be transformed into love. And that happens, the, the, the accelerated path of being transformed into love is learning how to carry one's cross. I mean, I say when things are easy, when things are easy, it's not hard to love. But when things go wrong, then that, that's, what, that's what really, that, that's what pushes us into uh, an ability for love that we would never have known otherwise. John Paul II said that uh, his, he saw his father, right, who witnessed his wife, so John Paul II's mother, die at a young age. And then um, John Paul II's older brother also died. He was, he was a doctor in treating, in treating patients. He contracted a disease and died. And then he saw his own country invaded by the Nazis. Uh, and he said he, he saw his dad suffer through all of this. But he said all of these blows cracked open his heart and made it capable of receiving so much more love and giving so much love. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a hard kind of a thing to say because we do not want to see people suffer, of course not. But, but through our cross and through carrying our cross, we become capable of, 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 of a much, much greater love than comfort and wealth and perfection of everything around us will ever make us capable of. So does God want us to suffer before we get to heaven? No, God wants us to be transformed into love before we get to heaven. And that does happen also through our cross and through suffering. But God doesn't want suffering. He wants love. So we have to be careful. The, the, the distinction is very, very important. Like In the same way that, you know, do you want your child to do well in sport? Well, yeah, yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great if they did well in sport. Ah, so you want the broken fingers that they came home with when they were playing hurling. No, I didn't want them to break their fingers, like, but, you know, it's kind of par it's part of hurting. I mean, I, I, it's better that it wouldn't happen. It's, but if they have to go to training, and training is painful you know, at times, and you get hit, or you fall, or it's cold, uh, it's, it's part of it, but I don't want them to suffer. You understand the difference, like, from a parent's perspective. You know, you don't want them to be bored out of their tree studying, but you do want them to get an education. So sometimes you just, yeah, you have to go through these things. But the goal of it all at the end is good. Education, medals on the wall, display cabinet, and ultimately, of course, from God's perspective, eternal life. That's, that's worth whatever we go through here. As St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, you know, I consider, I consider that the sufferings that we go through now are not even worth comparing to the glory about to be revealed to us. The sufferings that we go through now are not even worth comparing to the glory about to be revealed to us. Uh, there was a man named Michael, or Mikhail, and he was quite a smart guy in Russia. And uh, he saw the need for a new type of firearm, that their, their, their rifles were all quite long and cumbersome. So he saw the need for a new type of firearm. So he, smart guy, starts inventing and experimenting in uh, different types of, of rifles. And he invents what became known as the AK-47 in 1947. That's, that's where the, the name comes from. So his name was Mik Mikhail Kalashnikov. And so he invents this rifle. And it's very, very simple. It's very, very easy to, to mass produce. And out on the field, if it got dirty or something, you just clang it, pour a bit of water down it, and it'll work fine. It's just very, very practical in the field. Um, there, if, you, if you're not familiar, the, the, the guns with the so the, the whole thing that holds the bullets is called a, a, a magazine. The magazine is curved. You've seen them in many, sorry, every action movie has AK-47s. So this gun became very, very popular in, in Russia and then amongst all the Russian states and then in, in an awful lot of countries in, in Africa too. But because it was actually lightweight and easy to manage and there was very little recoil, so kickback, uh, all sorts of countries would use it even for, for child soldiers. And so in Africa, uh, a lot of those countries where they have child soldiers, you'll see them standing there with AK-47s. They're cheap, easy to produce, and very simple. But towards the end of his life, seeing how, how this weapon had been produced in its millions, millions of this one type of rifle, and seeing how so many people had suffered and died because of it, Mikhail's conscience started to kick in and think, I've been given this freedom and I've been given a, a, a life to do something good with and 
what on earth have I done with it? And so he said, if my assault rifle took people's lives, which it did, that means that I'm responsible for their deaths. More people died at the end of that rifle than, than probably any other in all of history. The pain in my soul is unbearable. I keep asking myself this unresolved question, am I responsible for their deaths? So at the age of 91, he contacted the Russian Orthodox Church and said he, he, he wants to convert, he wants to, he wants to reconcile with God. And so, so he did, he converted and he confessed and that was in 2012. And he, he has since died, reconciled with God, but having had this profound experience of looking back on his life, thinking, I mean, of all, like he would be considered incredibly successful in any other field, like if it, and it's something you invented is famous the globe over. It's even in a couple of flags in, in Africa, you, you see two Kalashnikovs crossing like that. Uh, but at the end of it all, like you're famous, he actually wasn't that wealthy because it was during communism, so he didn't get any bonuses for his gun. But he was famous. Uh, but what has my life actually achieved? You know, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is, is to learn to love. That's what it's all about. Moses said to the people, Listen, Israel. The Lord our God is the one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the key. That's the meaning of life. There you go. To love God above all things. That's it. That's what we're here for. As in, that's what the meaning of life is. That's why we have a life to learn to love. And once we've learned that, then we're ready to go. The goal was never that we would stay here forever. Once we've learned to love, we are ready to go. So that's, that's why we're here. So that's why being here now, having a time of retreat, is such a gift. To get those things back in order. Put the Lord back in the first place. And to listen to that most basic and simple of commands from the book of Deuteronomy. To love God above all things. So we pray that as our Jewish brothers do, they, they, they follow this, this uh, commandment kind of to the letter. They write these words uh, on a band and they wrap it around their hands and they have a little box that they put on their heads and the words are in there too. So let the, these words I urge, you, urge on you today be written on your heart. You shall repeat them to your children, say them over and over, whether at rest or in your house, walking or sleeping, lying down or, or, or rising. You shall fasten them on your hands as a sign and on your forehead as a circle. They do that literally. So you see it wrapped around, you know, uh, that there are these words here. But ultimately, the importance isn't that we have them written or even tattooed, for all you modern young people out there, tattooed on ourselves somewhere. The importance isn't that. The importance is that they're written on our hearts and lived. Because that is the meaning of life. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Let these words I urge on you today be written on your hearts. Amen.